Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 372nd episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new ankylosaur, which I'm going to cover, and a new sauropod, which Sabrina's going to cover. What a great way to start the year. What a surprise that that would be how we... <laughs> That's what we chose? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we also have dinosaur of the day, Chindisaurus, and a fun fact. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons for helping to keep the podcast running. We made it through another year thanks to our patrons' help. And we have three new patrons to thank this week because they piled up a little bit. We had pre-recorded one of the episodes. So this week, our new patrons are Sam Enchisaurus. Sam Enchisaurus. <laughs> like Momentosaurus, but with Sam. Excellent. Also, Oscar, who recently joined, as well as Jesse. Thank you all so much for joining and helping us to keep the podcast running. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Achilosaurus, Sezisaurus, Brad Shelby, Dino Mo, Ankylo Solace, Myco Raptor, and English Graham. Awesome. Thank you so much. What a great way to start the year. New sauropod, I guess new Ankylosaur. <laughs> you guess. And plus all our amazing patrons. So thank you. So jumping into the news, we're going to start with a new ankylosaur because obviously that is the more exciting story. I don't know about that, but I'll let you start anyway. This ankylosaur is really amazing. It is such a cool story, such a cool journal article, not just a story. <laughs> so it was published in Nature by Sergio Soto Acuna and others, and the title of it is great and tells a lot of the story. So it's bizarre tail weaponry in a transitional ankylosaur from sub-Antarctic Chile. So it's got a weird tail. It does, but it's also a transitional dinosaur and it's in the sub-Antarctic area. So it's just, it's all sorts of cool things. It is just as cool as it sounds. It's not just like, oh yeah, it sounds cool, but the animal itself isn't cool. It's a really cool <laughs> animal. And I've been waiting to discuss this since it was published in December, so it was technically published last year, like a lot of new dinosaurs we've yet to cover because we we're inundated with SVP and other stuff. But the new ankylosaur is named Stegouros elengassin, and Stegouros is from stego for roof, or really more like stegosaurus, and the Greek uros for tail, which is in reference to the covered tail, they said. And the species name, Ellen Gasson, is after an armored beast in the mythology of the local Aeonikank people, which that group is sometimes also referred to as the Southern Southern Tewelche people, because they're very far south. The Tewelche group is already very far south, but it's the southernmost of the southernmost, because this is practically at the very tip of southern south america almost to the strait of magellan not quite that far but really far south according to fizz.org the authors originally thought it was a stegosaur which is why it got the name stegouros and then later on they realized that it was an ankylosaur but they had already grown to appreciate the name stegouros so mm -hmm. they just stuck with it i guess they had called it that informally together for a while and the reason they thought that is the tail is a little bit more like a thagomizer on a stegosaurus than the club on ankylosaurus. And apparently they examined the tail first and sort of worked their way forward. And when they got to the skull, they realized, oh, that is an ankylosaurus skull. <laughs> <laughs> and the skull is really a better way to diagnose them. I mean, ankylosaurs are almost exclusively determined by their skull. But I could see why you'd want to start with the tail. Yeah, the tail is really amazing. They did find most of the animal, though, so that's why it took them a while to get to the head because it was a much better find than a typical ankylosaur find. You rarely find the skull and the tail, and in this case, the holotype CPAP-3165, and CPAP stands for the Antarctic and Patagonia Paleobiology Collection, although it's on display at INACH, which is the Chilean Antarctic Institute. I'm not sure why they have different abbreviations. And that's in Punta Arenas, and you can actually see it now. I went to their website, and they have a thing like, come see Stego Uros. <laughs> well, yeah, wouldn't you arms. advertise that if it's, you had it? <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. I have to add them to our map because I there aren't a lot of dinosaur discoveries in that area. I don't know if they have any other dinosaurs on display in that museum, but now that I think they're officially a dinosaur museum, so i got to add them to the map. 
also helps what they've added. It does. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is a really cool find. Before I get to the tail, because there's so much to say about the tail, I just want to go through some of the rest of the skeleton. So the skull is, again, very clearly ankylosaurian, which is the best way to identify an ankylosaur. You know, there are all these cool maps of the different osteoderms and the bumps and the horns and all those things around the head. And it has a unique set of those features. So it gets to be its own genus and species. But they also found the back half of the animal almost completely articulated. So it's got the tail, hips, legs, and feet all just like was in one thing put together. You could see what it was like when it was living. Nice. Really amazing. But in addition to that, they found most of the arms, hands, ribs, and most of the back and neck vertebrae. So it's really most of the animal. And some of those pieces too, like one of the arms was basically articulated too. Mm -hmm. So those articulated things tell you so much about the animal. There isn't any guesswork. Maybe this bone was from a different animal. Yeah. Maybe it was aligned differently. You know, it's this individual, and and then it gives you a better idea of the size of everything. Yep, exactly. And you're not going to mix up different bones like, oh, that was actually a metacarpal and not a metatarsal or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. They also found most of the jaw and several pieces of the skull, although actually of all of it, I think the skull is probably the least complete, <laughs> which is a little unfortunate when it's an ankylosaur. But they did find maybe a half or a third of it, which was enough to identify it as a new species. And then when you combine it with all the osteoderms, especially on the tail, mm -hmm. it really deserves its own name. So I guess I could talk about the tail now that I've <laughs> been leading up to it long enough. The tail itself is nearly 30 vertebrae long, which is actually shorter than most ankylosaur tails. And they describe it as sort of dog-sized in general. And the tail, I think, is sort of in proportion to the rest of the animal, sort of like a long dog tail, hmm. which is very short for an ankylosaur. Usually they have really long tails. Yeah. And if you have weaponry at the end of the tail, that makes sense because you want to be able to reach things with it. You don't want it really close to the body. And for that mechanical advantage of a long tail with a club on the end or a spike on the end, in mm -hmm. the case of like a stegosaur, you want a long tail. So this is a very weirdly short tail. And about half of the tail is covered in basically that weaponry at the end. So it's more like a glyptodont or something. Oh. Where it's got a not a lot of motion before, not a lot of distance that mm -hmm. it can move that big clubby thing. They could still pack a punch. Yeah, I'm sure. So half of the tail is covered in the osteoderms, and it's seven pairs of large triangular osteoderms sticking out of the sides. And the fact that they're pointy and sticking out of the sides is what makes it look more like a stegosaur than an ankylosaur, because usually ankylosaurs are big round things, you know, like a club, or it's just a fused series of vertebrae as like a bat. This, I think the best analogy, is like a really, really big double-headed axe. It's the best analogy I could come up with. I looked through some different medieval weaponry trying to come up with a better analogy, and I can't think of anything better than a double-headed axe, but it's sort of spiky. So you could also think of it as like one of those clubs that have spikes sticking out of the side of it, but they're very sharp and like broad, more like an axe head. Hmm. It's pretty crazy. The overall dimensions of it, so that mass of seven pairs of osteoderms, is about 30 centimeters or one foot long. And about 15 centimeters or half a foot wide, but only about five centimeters or two inches thick. So that's what gives it that sort of axe, but like a really long axe mm -hmm. <laughs> head. Like if you took a if you took a baseball bat, say, and you put sharpened blades on half of the length of that bat, hmm. that's sort of what you'd end up with sticking out of both sides. Okay. I feel like I saw that at that when we went to see Zool at the Royal Ontario Museum and they had all these medieval weapons yeah. to kind of compare what ankylosaur tails were like. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody knows a better analogy than a double-headed axe, I'd be happy to hear it. But it's the best thing I could come up with. It's also sort of weird because it's like seven individual points sticking out of it. It's not just like one single blade mm -hmm. on the edge. Although we don't know. So this doesn't have a keratin covering on it. So we don't know what it would have looked like when it was covered in keratin. Right. Is it even... Well, it's definitely bigger, mm -hmm. but how much bigger and what colors? Yeah, and what shape exactly. Mm -hmm. It's possible that the keratin sort of connected them, I suppose, but I think it's more likely that it was individual spikes. That would probably be more menacing anyway. Yeah. So be a good strategy, I think. You can tell from far away, oh, don't mess with this tail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a porcupine. 
that piece of the tail is about one foot long, which isn't that different than, say, like an ankylosaurus. You know, its club might be about the actual knobby part of the club with the osteoderms might be about a foot long. But the entire animal, the entire length of Stegouros is only about 1.5 to 1.65 meters long or about five to five and a half feet, which means that club takes up about 20 percent of the length of its body. (laughs) (laughs) It's probably the most important feature it's got. Yeah, but it might explain why it doesn't need a really long tail because it's such a small animal that maybe it was more agile. Mm -hmm. And so if it could turn its whole body quicker, then it doesn't need to be, you know, real flexible in the tail end. It's almost like this ankylosaur is one of those, well, I guess the the saying is speak softly and carry a big stick, but yeah. maybe walk softly, carry a big stick. <laughs> or big axe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is dog sized, but with that, that crazy thing on its tail. And originally it was reported as two meters long, which I already thought was very small for an ankylosaur. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, it's small for a dinosaur, let alone an ankylosaur, which tend to be pretty big. And this is also from the late Cretaceous, where ankylosaurus, it's almost at the same time, it's a couple million years before ankylosaurus, but around the same time, an ankylosaurus was the biggest ankylosaur. You know, you're talking 20 plus feet long, and Stegouros is only two meters or like six feet long. But Two meters was actually an overestimate. So that was like the original early reporting. Then the text of the document says 1.8 to two meters long. And then they have a comment that says, oh, that was actually an earlier estimate. We should have updated it in the paper. It's really more like 1.5 to 1.65, which is like five to five and a half feet. So that's a very small animal. And it makes it about 50 centimeters or only about a foot and a half tall. (laughs) So like even dog size, like it's, it's smaller than some dogs, really. It's, it's a, it would be really cute. It might be a fun pet as long as it's not coming after you with its spiky tail. Yeah. (laughs) Watch out for the tail. By comparing its features, they found that phylogenetically its closest relative is Antarctopelta, which is always kind of a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. It's possible that Antarctopelta also had that crazy sword tail. Yeah, be cool. Yeah, we didn't find Antarctopelta's tail with the original discovery. Like they started out with teeth and then they found some more bones. They've got some limb bones and I think a little bit nearish to the tail, some vertebrae and stuff. But we don't have any of the osteoderms or the part of the tail that would really show it. But they have enough in common that it's possible that they would have had the same type of tail. They're both from around the same time. They're in the late Cretaceous, roughly 72 plus or minus a couple million years each. So like really close in time. And Antarctica and South America were basically joined in the Cretaceous. Maybe not by that point. They might have separated by 72 million years ago or on and off separated. But they were close enough, especially with a little bit of swimming and floating and you know, ankylosaurs can do some floating. <laughs> sure. We know they can float and boat, Borealopelta. Bloat and float? Bloat and float, yeah. Yeah, but that's after they die. <laughs> that doesn't really help for migrating. <laughs> <laughs> but it also has some things in common with Kunbarosaurus, although Kunbarosaurus is actually about 30 million years older than Stegouros. So maybe not, it might not have had that crazy tail. And we do have a Kunbarosaurus tail and it doesn't have any sign of that crazy double-headed axe pointy seven osteoderm spike thing going on. Stego Uros was found in Magallanes, Chile, which is actually closer to Antarctica than it is to Bolivia. That's how far south it is. <laughs> it is crazy far south. The closest ankylosaur that can be identified as a species that I could find anywhere on any of the maps is Antarctopelta, so maybe it's not too surprising that it also seems to be the closest relative. And Antarctopelta is on James Ross Island in Antarctica, which is about a thousand miles away. It's far, but not crazy far, and it would have been closer back then in the Cretaceous. Back then, Australia also was still touching, or at least it was in some part of the Cretaceous, Mm -hmm. which explains why Kumbarosaurus and Stegouros and... Antarctopelta are all so closely related, presumably. So the authors actually proposed a new group, which they call Paraankylosauria, to include these southern Gondwanan ankylosaurs. That makes sense, since they're all from, they're basically neighbors. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> slightly distant neighbors, but yeah, I mean, they have more in common. I don't know. These names a lot of times don't catch on because it's just like there's only three things in it. You just call out the yeah. one you're talking about, but it might, especially if we find more ankylosaurs from Gondwana. We really don't have many. They're usually from Laurasia in the north. Especially if they all have these weird tails. Yeah. They really stand out. Definitely. So in summary, I think 2021 was probably the best year ever for weird ankylosaurs. Was it? Because Stego Uros is really cool with this blade-like tail. Mm -hmm. But we also had Spico Melis with its spikes sticking up out of its rib. <laughs> Two types of osteoderms we've never seen in an ankylosaur before. That's true. It's pretty fantastic. So ankylosaurs are the best. This is more uh, evidence of it. Uh, they're pretty cool. I don't know if I'd go so far <laughs> to say the best. I would. I definitely would. I know. That's not surprising. If we're ever in Punta Arenas... We got to go see this. Oh, definitely. We also have a lot of sauropod sites to see, too. Just saying. <laughs> on the way. Yeah. On the way south. We're yeah. Just drive the whole continent. <laughs> make, make a few stops. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Now we can get to the real news. That was real news. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the real good news? That was real good news, too. Okay. The next piece of good news. The sauropod news. Yeah. There's a new eusauropod, Romaleopacus terpenensis, that was named by Paul Upchurch and others, and this was published in Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. Again, this is one of those that came out in 2021, but we're doing a little catch up here. That is quite a name, Romaleopacus. Mm -hmm. It means robust forearm. How many syllables is that? Six? Yeah. It's too many. I don't think it's the most. Same number as Parasaurolophus. Yeah. And that one's widely regarded as ridiculously hard to say. Is it? I think <laughs> yeah. I'm so used to saying that one, it feels like it rolls off the tongue it now. It does, yeah. So maybe the same will happen with Roma Leopacus. <laughs> I kind of doubt it. Well, that was already smoother than the first time I tried. Good. <laughs> so originally, Roma Leopacus was thought to be Hudiasaurus sinojaponorum. That was based on on a vertebra, four teeth, and a nearly complete forelimb. But the authors reanalyzed these fossils and then compared them to other sauropods and found that, okay, the vertebra was still the holotype of Hudiasaurus, but they assigned the forelimb to this new dinosaur, and they said that the teeth, the four teeth, they were not well-preserved, but they looked Mementosaurus-like, and they said it was too incomplete to incorporate in a phylogenetic analysis and said, quote, we refrain from erecting a new genus or species at this time pending further discoveries. That has to do with the teeth. So it turns out that that forelimb and the holotype cervical vertebra, that neck vertebra, that is the holotype of Hudiasaurus, were found in different quarries. But they were only about 0.6 miles or a kilometer apart. That's pretty far for being in the same holotype. They also, well, yeah, so the authors did warn that the fossils for both these dinosaurs don't overlap. That does make it hard to compare whether or not it should be the same dinosaur. But in their phylogenetic analysis, these two dinosaurs, Hudiosaurus and Romaleopacus, were clustered with other dinosaurs with features that overlapped. So they could see the differences that way. I don't think I've ever heard of Hudiosaurus before either. So that one was named in 1997. The fossils were found in 1993. It was named by Dong Juming. And the genus name means butterfly lizard that's based on the shape of the vertebral spine. Oh, uh, yeah. A lot of vertebrae are sort of butterfly shaped. Yeah. That's a good name for it. So I'm glad the holotype is that vertebra so it still applies. <laughs> that's true. It would be <laughs> funny if the holotype, like the vertebra, got removed from yeah. it and there wasn't even a vertebra that was named after a bone. It's not even an animal <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then the species name is in honor of the Sino-Japanese Silk Road Dinosaur Expedition. Now this new dinosaur... Romaleopacus terpenensis. That genus name, Romaleopacus, am I getting smoother as I say it? Yeah. Okay, good. That <laughs> means robust forearm, and the species name refers to the Turpin Basin where the holotype was found. Romaleopacus just means robust forearm? Yes. That is so much to say for such a simple thing. It's two Greek words. Man, is it, it's like 
Popeye arm. That's basically <laughs> what they're saying. <laughs> kind of. But I guess they didn't want to name it Popeye Saurus. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound as cool. <laughs> So both Hudiosaurus and Romaliopacus are Mementosaurids, and that's that group known for their very long necks. Mm -hmm. Hudiosaurus, though, is most closely related to Xingjian Titan, and Romaliopacus is most closely related to Twangiosaurus and Analong. But they're all Mementosaurids? Yes. Okay. So the robust forearm, Romaliopacus, it's based on this nearly complete right forelimb the arm bones in the hand. The forelimb was about six and a half feet or two meters long. And Romaliopacus is estimated to be between 65 to 82 feet or 20 and 25 meters long. That seems like two meters long seems pretty long, but that's for the entire leg. Forelimb. Yeah, but that's a, that's a whole leg. The oh, front leg. Yeah. So, I mean, they don't say arm because it's the... Right, because they're quadrupedal. But Yeah. But for something that's over 60 feet long, it seems like the leg should be more than six feet long. It just seems like it's really low to the ground. I guess it could be that it's one of those where it's tilting downwards, like its back legs or its actual legs are long, and then its four limbs slash arms I mean, are shorter. Being a mementosaurid, the length will be all in its neck. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's true. So its body might be proportionally smaller than you'd expect for something that's 65 feet long. Yeah. Because it's just all neck and tail. <laughs> they also think it was probably much heavier than other sauropods that it lived among. It lived about 155 million years ago in the late Jurassic. They said for Roma Leopacus, there's three distinguishing features, including, quote, one of the most robust ulnae of any known sauropod. Cool. And that's why they think it's a bit heavier than the other sauropods. It was found along with other sauropods in the area. So, you know, it lived with other long necks. <laughs> it also had a deltopectoral crest, quote, more prominent than those of most sauropods. That's where the upper arm muscles attach. And the radius was also very robust and had a lot of flexibility at the elbow joint. No humorous, though, I guess. Or at least not much talk about it. At least not that's been found yet, but... Maybe there's more in the Turpin Basin. Oh, and the Turpin Basin's in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region in China. The author said there's some convergent evolution of these large arms with the robust muscle attachments that are found in core Mementosaurus-like taxa and titanosaurs, as well as some ornithischians, ceratopsids, and that may mean that they kept their forearms more flexed. They were more sprawled or slanting rather than upright. For the non-sauropods, the ornithischians, so not the mementosaurs and the titanosaurs, they might still have reared up on their hind legs to get food. But for the mementosaurs in particular that had the sprawl position with the larger necks and the shorter tails, their center of body mass was also shifted more forward. That makes sense. If you get a super crazy long neck, that it's going to make you a little front heavy. Yeah. So that's why it had bulkier forelimbs potentially, because it's got to support a lot of that weight at the front of the animal. Yeah. And for Romaliopacus in particular, its forelimb might have actually played a larger role in walking since the center of mass was shifted more forward. Mm. So instead of being able to rear up on its back legs to reach food, it could have moved more efficiently or have a more range of motion or move a little faster when traveling, quote, between patchily distributed food sources. I wonder if there are any sauropods or quadrupedal dinosaurs that did sort of like a mule kick. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like if anyone could, it might be like Romaliopacus or one of these mementosaurids. But they're so front heavy that they're f they couldn't get their arms off the ground or their front legs off the ground, but their hind legs maybe kick at something <laughs> something that's bothering it in the back maybe. yeah yeah <laughs> that'd be pretty funny and our last bit of dinosaur news for this episode is that chief chickalemi elementary school in sunbury pennsylvania has a new six foot diplodocus femur on display chief chickalemi is a really fun word or name for an elementary school yeah and they have a dinosaur on display how many schools can say that how many elementary schools can say that that is awesome. Is it a real, it's an original fossil? It was unclear, I think, maybe. 
They said Barry and April James from Prehistoric Journeys donated the femur. Interesting. I'm not familiar with them. I don't know if they're dealing in replicas or original fossils. I just looked them up. They do both. Okay. (laughs) So we've cleared up nothing. (laughs) Dinosaurs and prehistoric mammals. They've been doing this for a long time, too. That's cool. I mean, either way, it's exciting to have. And either way, you're probably not going to get to touch it if you're at the school. Right. The Jameses from Prehistoric Journeys, they also want to donate a second Diplodocus femur to the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. So these fourth graders from the elementary school in Pennsylvania wrote letters to their senators asking to put this fossil on display. (laughs) And one student, Landon Lawrence, said, quote, no other children get to see a dinosaur bone. So now when this goes to the Capitol, everyone else will. It's a very sweet sentiment. That is nice. Considering how dinosaurs are so much a part of Americana, Mm -hmm. it would be nice to have. We should have more like national symbols of dinosaurs. (laughs) We got Dinosaur bones everywhere. Exactly. We got eagles and like <laughs> the modern stuff, but what about the cool prehistoric stuff? <laughs> Put them on some coins and some stamps and in some federal buildings. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> and now on to our dinosaur of the day, Chindisaurus, which was a request from Paleo Mike 716 and Crow via our Patreon and Discord. So thank you. Chindisaurus was a basal sauruscian that lived in the late Triassic in what is now Arizona in the U.S., and maybe it's also been found in New Mexico and Texas. It looks like a small theropod, walked on two legs, and it had a long tail. So if it's a sauruscian, that means it could be either a theropod or a sauropod, right? Yes, well, it's considered to be basal, so it's at a point before the sauropods, before the sauropodomorphs, I should say, and the theropods split off. The type and only species is Chindisaurus brian smalli. A partial skeleton was found in the Petrified Forest National Park in 1984 and then was airlifted out in 1985. And that area, in the 1920s, Charles Camp from the University of California, Berkeley, collected fossils and took photos of the Petrified Forest. And then in the 1980s, Robert Long from Berkeley found camp sites. And Brian Small, who was on the team collecting fossils, found the ankle bone of Chindisaurus, which is how he got that species name. At the time that Chindisaurus was found, it was thought to be the oldest dinosaur ever found. Oh, really? So like earliest in the Mesozoic, in other words? Yeah. And so in the 80s. So it was really big news when it was airlifted out. The holotype has a nickname, Gertie. That's after Gertie the dinosaur. (laughs) That tells you about when it was found. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Gertie, the really amazing, super early animation from like the 19 teens, right? 1914, yeah. It's also sometimes known as the Chindi Point dinosaur because of where the specimen was found. So even though it was airlifted out in 1985, Chindisaurus wasn't described until 1995 by R.A. Long and P.A. Murray. And the genus name, Chindisaurus, means ghost lizard or lizard from Chindi Point. Hmm. That's like Spectro Venator. Except that's ghost hunter instead of ghost lizard. (laughs) A little bit, yeah. And in a different language, obviously. Well, so this Jita's name comes from the Navajo word chindi, which means ghost or evil spirit. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. Ghost and fossil do seem to make sense together. Although I never think of fossils as ghost-like. I don't either. I always think of them as like, this is what it was like when it was alive. And I think of them almost as living things. Maybe because fossils are tangible. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They're not, they don't have that same like elusive quality of a ghost <laughs> and so the species name brian small is in honor of brian small who found the holotype who would have guessed it yeah the holotype includes vertebrae limb bones and hit fragments and it was prepared at the university of california museum of paleontology in berkeley california now fragmentary skeletons have been found in arizona new mexico and texas but not all of these may belong to chindisaurus mm, okay these referred specimens, they're incomplete, and they include vertebrae and femur fragments. Although there was one complete femur found in 2006 in Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. More ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> but some of these referred specimens might not be Chindisaurus because they don't have features unique to Chindisaurus. They're too fragmentary to know. Hmm. In 2019, Adam Marsh and others said that only the holotype should be considered to be Chindisaurus. There was a partial ilium found in Texas in the Tacovas Formation that was thought to be Chindisaurus, but then in 1998, Hunt and others named it as a new taxon, 
Casasaurus. In 2004, though, Langer said that Casasaurus and Chindisaurus were the same, and Nesbitt and others supported this idea in 2007, saying that what made Casasaurus and Chindisaurus different was just variation in size. But they didn't formally synonymize the two because that ilium of Chindisaurus is too fragmentary. So, again, too hard to compare. Then in 2018, Barron and Williams re described Casasaurus and found, yes, that's a valid dinosaur. So we're back to just the holotype is Chindisaurus. And that holotype may not be an adult that's based on an unfused ankle. Long and Murray estimated Chindisaurus to be 9.9 to 13.1 feet or 3 to 4 meters long and to have a stout body, long legs, and a long neck. But then in 2012, Benson and Brusati estimated Chindisaurus to be 6.6 feet to 7.5 feet or 2 to 2.3 meters long. Also in 2012, Holtz estimated Chindisaurus to be about 6.6 feet or 2 meters long and weigh 50 to 100 pounds or 23 to 45 kilograms, or about the same as a wolf. Interesting. That's pretty small, but I mean, if you're talking about Triassic stuff that's even older than the first sauropodomorphs, it's actually not that small. It seems like maybe even fairly large for these basal creatures, at least their early estimate. The later estimates seem more typical. Yeah, it's still pretty big for Triassic, I think. No skull of Chindisaurus has been found, but Chindisaurus did have large tail vertebrae at the base that got longer towards the tip of the tail. It also had long, low cervical vertebrae, so its neck was probably light and slender, and it had a large crescent-shaped femur. Yeah, sounds like uh, pretty much all the early (laughs) dinosaurs. Yeah. There's been a lot of debate over what type of dinosaur Chindisaurus was. At times, it was thought to be a basal sauropodomorph, and then later thought to be a herrerasaurid. So now we just say sauriscian. Yeah, basal sauriscian. <laughs> yeah, 2007, Nesbitt and others, and Ermis and others suggested it was a basal sauriscian. And when those are the only bones you have, you don't have a skull, and you're you're just basing it on a couple of body elements that have a lot in common with other animals, that's probably, yeah, the best you can do. Yeah. A phylogenetic analysis found Chindisaurus to be a sister taxon, so very closely related to a Tawa Hale. Previously, Chindisaurus was thought to be a Herrerasaurid and Tawa was thought to be a theropod, but now they're thought to be very closely related. And they're both placed within basal Sauriscia, which, again, that's before sauropodomorphs and theropods split off. In 2019, Adam Marsh and others re-described Chindisaurus and found Chindisaurus and Tawa to be, quote, a potentially diverse group of early theropods prior to the end Triassic mass extinction. Yeah, potentially early theropods, or potentially early sauropodomorphs, or potentially before either of those. (laughs) Yeah, it just seems difficult to classify Triassic animals. Yeah. In 2019, Morgan Schaller and others, researchers from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and University of Texas Austin, found that oxygen levels rapidly increased over a 3 million year period around the time that Chindisaurus lived. So what they did was they analyzed small amounts of gas from rocks from the Colorado Plateau and the Newark Basin. They were around 621 miles or 1,000 kilometers away from each other when it was Pangaea and they were near the equator. And that was around 215 million years ago. And they found that oxygen levels went from 15% to 19% and there was a drop in carbon dioxide levels. And for comparison, today we're at 21% oxygen levels. So there's probably a global change in oxygen levels around this time. Also around this oxygen peak, that's when some of the first dinosaurs appeared in the tropics of what's now North America, like Chindisaurus. Though dinosaurs were in what is now South America earlier, about 232 million years ago. But sauropods came soon after. That's really what you want. Yeah. So these higher oxygen levels, they might have helped animals grow larger. Maybe. Maybe. There's probably a lot of factors. Uh, At the very least, the environmental changes were good for evolutionary diversification. Though, again, there might have been other factors that helped. That's a good point. Yeah, because the drop in oxygen killed some stuff off. And then when it bounces back, all of a sudden dinosaurs have some space to go into. (laughs) Yeah. So Chindisaurus lived on an ancient floodplain, and other animals that lived around the same time and place included 
archosaurs, pseudosuchians, tetrapods, phytosaurus, coelophysis, lungfish, and clams. There's a short documentary, and thank you to PaleoMike716 who told us about this. It's about 30 minutes long that was made about Chindisaurus in 1988 called A Whopping Small Dinosaur. <laughs> and that's about the expedition and assembly of Chindisaurus. Whopping small. Yeah. <laughs> wonder how many times they call it Gertie. It's a good nickname. Mm-hmm. I could definitely see if you found a sauropod around the time that that animation was popular. Name it Gertie. Although it ends up maybe not being a sauropod. Certainly not a Gertie-like big you sauropod. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be because Gertie was the first animated dinosaur and this was thought to be the oldest dinosaur at the time. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, like oldest that it's like a historical mm-hmm. <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, our fun fact of the day is that Stegouros is the only named dinosaur from Magallanes in Chile. Bringing it back to the ankylosaurs, I see. Yeah, yeah, I got to talk about Stegouros more. Even though that name, I'm I'm emphasizing the Uros part and that distinction because I don't want to say it at all like Stegosaurus. Mm-hmm. So I'm Stegouros. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's also the farthest south named dinosaur anywhere in the world, excluding Antarctica, which is pretty cool. That because is. South America is way farther, farther south than New Zealand or Australia or South Africa get, which is why everybody who goes to Antarctica goes through South America because it's a lot closer. And also, there is that piece of Antarctica that sort of sticks up. So there's only about 600 miles in between South America and and Antarctica at the narrowest oh, point. Oh, wow. I always forget. Yeah, it's pretty close. So this dinosaur was listed at about 50.7 degrees south, which is really far south. It's not quite in the Antarctic Circle. That starts at 66 and a half degrees south. So there's still about 15 degrees away from the Antarctic Circle. But it's close. It's, it's very far south. I mean, 50 degrees is very far from the equator. Mm-hmm. That's like in there isn't any part of the U.S. other than Alaska that goes that far north. It's it's up there. According to the Paleobio database, the only other dinosaur fossils in Magallanes are unidentified sauropod, theropod, and ornithischian bones, but they're all unidentified. So it, it's the only named dinosaur. It's pretty unique in that way. But Stegouros was found just a few miles from the border with Argentina, and on the Argentina side of the border. There are a few more dinosaurs, but the Argentinian finds are a bit to the north. They're all to the north, in fact. So that's why it's the farthest south. It's not farthest south by a long shot. You know, it's like 20 miles maybe by the farthest south. But farthest is farthest. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting to me is that even though it's really far south and it's pretty remote, the weather really is pretty decent in Magallanes. So as of this recording, it's 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Or 18 degrees Celsius, which just, it doesn't sound that bad. You're thinking about Antarctica way far towards the poles, but it's surrounded by water. It's got some good currents going. It's also in the middle of summer there, which doesn't hurt (laughs) because early January is like their July compared to the Northern Hemisphere, at least. And it's not even that sparsely populated. It's got about 1.3 people per square kilometer, which is about half as dense as Montana. And they can get a lot of paleontology done in Montana. Mm Mm-hmm. So where there's a will, there's a way. I'm just guessing that the outcrops aren't as good there, and that's probably why they're finding less dinosaurs, because the only finds that they have are right near the Argentinian border. All of that area that's in the mountains is tundra and difficult, and who knows, maybe the rocks are even not old enough. But we do have quite a few dinosaurs on James Ross Island in Antarctica, which is about a thousand miles to the southeast and is a similar date range. So we do know something about what animals were probably in this area. Of course, crossing the Drake Passage to Antarctica isn't the easiest, so we can easily do a lot more research and investigating in South America than we can in Antarctica. The moral of the story is, Stego Uros is spectacular. (laughs) Not only is it the first one with this crazy double axe tail, it's the farthest south in South America, and just really interesting all around. But how robust was its forearm? (laughs) Not very robust. It was a little (laughs) tiny dog thing. I don't know if I mentioned, too, when we were talking about it, it's pretty, they're pretty sure it's an adult based on the fusion of the bones and Mm. stuff, and it's still only like five feet long. 
and a foot and a half tall. Yeah. As an adult. That's adorable. It's like a little Bumpy. If Bumpy <laughs> had a really crazy saw tail going on. Yeah. yeah it's pretty cool. Well, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. It's not too late to get our special art for our patrons for 2021. So you can sign up at patreon.com slash I Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.